Well, hello, welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. Okay. Uh, today we're nice talking with you, Kevin Dempsey. Uh, Kevin is a Coventry born guitarist, songwriter, producer, arranger, and tutor. His innovative guitar playing has gained the respect of both music fan and fellow musicians. Beginning as a co-founder of psych progressive folk band, Dando Shaft, Kevin has stayed very busy in the decades following, lending his services in support of artists as diverse as Alice Coltrane and ex felt members Van Denham, and in between playing alongside a veritable who's who in folk music. Being much in demand, his guitar and vocals can be found on a plethora of recordings that continue to this day. Prolific is one way to describe Kevin's musical output. I, I probably should have set aside a whole day to talk with Mr. Dempsey as there's much to discuss. Well, well, welcome, Kevin. Hi, Greg. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Yeah. So you were born in Coventry. Talk yep. about uh, what you remember from your childhood and growing up there. Well, uh, I don't remember much of the first couple of years or whatever. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I just had a great childhood. You know, that's all I can remember. Things were a lot different back in, uh, back in the day, and mm. uh, you could just go out. Like when I came home from school or whatever, I was just out. I just went out till my mother just shouted on the doorstep for me to come back. <laughs> but like with my kids and even my grandkids, you don't do that now. Mm -hmm. You don't let them out unsupervised, you know. It's a kind of different world we live in now. So, uh, but anyway, I, you know, Coventry is great school. I don't know about school. I was, uh, I went to like a Catholic, my secondary school was Catholic grammar school, you know, uh, run by Vincentian fathers, you know, mm -hmm. kind of monks, very scary, <laughs> very scary all dressed in black and uh yeah really but, uh, but generally great yeah i had a great time um were you born into a musical family were either either parent a musician well you can say that you could say musician my dad was a drummer mm -hmm. you know and there's the joke isn't there about uh, a drummer is somebody who hangs around with musicians you know <laughs> yeah. so uh but anyway yeah so my dad was a, a drummer and they used to have a uh, kind of band rehearsals at my house mm -hmm. so I'd be kind of sitting in and just listening to what was going on you know and uh, that was my first instrument you know I guess because my dad was a drummer so I wanted to be a, a drummer as well you know so I started lessons when I was about seven something like that mm -hmm. and uh, played in a couple of bands you know when I was I think 13 was the first one I can't remember the name of it, but it was just, I don't know, four kids about 13 years old and we were just playing the pop songs of the day, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, it, I wasn't re it wasn't necessarily a hugely musical family, but I heard a lot of music, you know, when I was a, a kid, yeah. Right, that's what I was, I was going to ask you, is do you remember the music that was being played in the house when you were, when you were yeah, young? Yeah, there was a lot. My dad... You know, well, like uh, Irish, and uh, he liked country and western mm. uh, Irish music, obviously, kind of Cayley music, dance tunes, jigs and reels, and stuff. And he also liked big bands, so I heard a lot of that. But my mum was from a family of 12, you know, so 12 kids, and uh, I had a lot of uncles who weren't necessarily that much older than me, you know. And they were really into uh, people like Little Richard and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And we, I still love Little Richard to this day. I mean, that is the voice of rock and roll, isn't it? I, well, for me, it's just Little Richard, the business, you know. I actually thought when I was a kid that he was this little guy. I, I've never <laughs> seen him on TV or nothing. So I just imagined he was about two or three foot high. <laughs> sang like that, you know, incredible. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I, I know he had a. He said that he had uh, inspired the Beatles. Or yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can hear that, can't you? I mean, you know, the long tall Sallys and 
all of those that the Beatles did and the woo, you mm. know, the mm -hmm. woo mm. from Little Richard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is that influence there. Well, what about, do you remember your first single or album that you ever got? Ah, now, yeah, this is one I'm quite <laughs> embarrassed to mention. But my first, the first album that I bought was uh, a Johnny and the Hurricanes album. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know that's quite embarrassing, isn't it? But, <laughs> but that was it anyway. And I, I, you know, whatever. I can't even remember how old I was yeah. when I got that, yeah. but uh, 10 or something. But I loved it, you know, Rocking Goose and Red <laughs> River Rock and all this kind of stuff. Because they had a kind of, uh, I don't know what it was. It was some kind of way back in the day, some kind of keyboard that mm. didn't play piano sounds or it wasn't an organ. And uh, anyway, I loved it. I, I did love it. But there you go. That's my embarrassing. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of those uh, instrumental guitar bands were, were, were quite good, you know. Um, you know, yeah. during the yeah, yeah. So there's, yeah, I loved there's it. You know. Two of them, you know. Uh, you you mentioned that you uh, played drums first. Um, at what age did you switch to guitar? I I was sixteen. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a. I was into the the first band I played was just like a covers band, and we were just you know four thirteen year olds playing pop songs and stuff, chart material. And then I got into this band called the Bow Weevils. They okay. were like a three sax band and a organ keyboards bass drums and uh, a singer and we started off when i no, they were already going i, I joined them uh, and uh, they were playing a lot of this alexis corner stuff at the time oh. a lot of alexis yeah. corner and his rhythm and blues all stars mm -hmm. uh, dick exel smith and cyril davis on harmonica all that anyway i just that was an introduction to me to that kind of thing but over the I was with them for, I don't know, 18 months, two years, and it changed to more soul music. Mm. So we began to be uh, listening to the impressions, who I love, you know, Solomon Burke, oh. Rawls, Joe Tex, you know, Motown stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, that's how the, the kind of band evolved into that, some Otis Redding material, you know, and stuff. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I loved it. But then... Uh, a friend, a school friend of mine, uh, who was into folk music, you know, he was kind of, he was very much into the, uh, like the CND, the campaign for nuclear disarmament and kind of left wing things. And uh, there was a folk concert on just near Coventry. And uh, he said, you should really come, you know, it's, uh, it'll be great. And oh God, you know, folk music. I didn't really know what it was, but my impression wasn't very positive, you know. And uh, anyway, I went along to this concert and it, it was just life changing for me. It was mm. just awesome, you know, and it wasn't necessarily, it was partly the music, of course, but it was also just the atmosphere in the room was right. just, uh, I don't know, it was so warm and human and very different to uh, the kind of atmosphere in some of these clubs I've been playing with mm -hmm. the soul music thing. And uh, anyway, it, it kind of hit that in the, in that time in the sixties, the like the muse kind of descended on oh, okay. acoustic music and folk mm -hmm. music, you know, with your Pentangles and your John Martins and your Bert Yance, your Davy Graham, Sandy Denny, Jackson C. Frank, all of those kind of people. Uh, yeah, and I just kind of fell in love with it all and. Uh, I wanted to play the guitar, which was very unfortunate kind of for my dad, you know, because he, he'd actually just brought me a new drum kit, and, oh, uh, okay. which was fantastic. But then after this folk concert, I didn't want to play them anymore. You know, I wanted to, I just started practicing the guitar like mad, you know, and uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he was quite disappointed, but... He did help me out with buying my first guitar for me and uh, yeah so he was disappointed but then pleased that I was still doing music or stuff music. You know. yeah. yeah that's what I was going to ask you were both parents pretty supportive of, uh, of the direction yeah. You were going? yeah amazing when I look back at it it was I mean at the time I just 
kind of assumed that they would be I guess like kids do you know you just uh, you don't realize the support that they are giving you well you do a bit but now I'm a parent myself and a grandparent I understand what they went through to kind of help me out you know mm -hmm. and in this band the bow weevils I mean we'd be playing all nighters you know at the weekend I'd be going over to Birmingham or up to Manchester Blackpool playing the Twisted Wheel Clubs they were really kind of quite cool places to be playing but we'd be playing all nighters you know and I was like 14 15 mm. and my parents let me do it which I don't think I would be right <laughs> <as a> parent <laughs> now <laughs> you know but anyway yes yeah, so they were very supportive yeah very supportive yeah I have a, a 16 year old and we have a curfew you know so I don't know for sure. Yeah, like you said, I don't know if I want him out, you know, real late. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. I mean, so, it's, I think it's a more dangerous kind of world we live in now. But true. still, it's a big thing, you know, to let your 14 year old out. True. Music clubs. You know. <laughs> true. Well, uh, so was uh, Dando Shaft your first folk band that you were? Part of? Yeah, first band that I played guitar in. Yeah. Okay. okay. And that, uh, yeah, through this going to this particular folk concert that kind of changed my life. I, uh, I don't know, a year or so later, I met a guy called Dave Cooper, another Coventry-born guitarist. And so he was a more kind of accomplished than me uh, at the time. But when we started playing together, we just thought it was fantastic. I mean, you know, with that, I'm not being immodest. We just genuinely were totally enthused by it, you know, not big headed. We just loved it, you know. And uh, so we got a few songs together and uh, yeah, played a bit, played a few little clubs. But then we decided that it would be really great to have a, a multi-instrumentalist in the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave knew one. I'd seen this guy play at some of the folk clubs in Coventry, but I didn't know him. A guy called Martin Jenkins. Oh, who played yeah. Mandolin, flute, violin, guitar, whatever. He was a, a, an amazing player. And I played with him in Dando Shaft and later on in uh, a band Whippersnapper. But uh, yeah, so we, we went round to his house. We just turned up at his front door, knocked on it and uh, said, can we come in and have a play? And we just played for about four hours. I mean, literally nonstop. Uh, we just played. We didn't even talk, you know. I mean, we said hello and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Got our instruments out <laughs> and then just played. And it was uh, it was that kind of magical thing. Anyway, yeah. I don't, like I said, I don't want to get too spinal tap about it. But it was, uh, yeah, oh. it was beautiful, you know. It was well, lovely. Yeah. It sounds and like you we, really... And then we just decided that to, wouldn't it be great to have a bass player, a double bass player, and uh, Martin knew Roger, this guy Roger Bullen. Mm -hmm. So we got invited Roger around, and that was great. And then we decided, wouldn't it be great to have a percussionist? And uh, Martin knew Ted Kay, who was playing tablas and congas and, you know, bells and all the stuff. And uh, so we had a rehearsal together and uh, again it was just like magic you know I just loved it you know and that was it that was the start of the band we also actually uh, heard one night at the folk club in Coventry uh, a female singer Polly Bolton mm -hmm. and she came along to this club and just did a few songs with uh, June Tabor and uh, just almighty I mean they were they were like 17 years old or something like but I'd never heard anything like it it was extraordinary and we always said that uh, if the band keeps going and uh, we decide to augment with a female vocalist it has to be Polly has to be it Polly. just has to be Polly there was nobody else it ha and uh, it turned out to be Polly we did get Polly you know eventually you did get yeah. well talk about um recording uh, an evening with Dando Shaft. That was your first time in a recording studio, right? Uh, yeah, well, I'd done some demos playing the drums with this, uh, the Bow Weevils, but mm. not, not a recording, it was, we just did uh, 
two sides of a single just for us really just as like a demo and I haven't even got that I don't know where it is or anything I would like to have a copy of it but anyway uh yeah so uh sorry what where, where were we I've, I've lost it well you know somebody's going to come somebody's going to find that demo and then they're going to sell it on eBay for gobs of money watch watch no no the question was uh your first recording when you recorded an oh, yeah 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 how so did that was, yeah so that was with uh yeah dando shaft and uh we decided three of us martin dave and myself we did we played all the clubs kind of around coventry around the midlands area and we decided that we should go to London, you know, do that thing, go to London and uh, seek our fortune. So we just decided we'd go down for a weekend. Uh, we got the train down to London, bought a melody maker. That was the kind of music oh. newspaper of the day. And mm -hmm. in the back, they had all the adverts of the gigs. And uh, so there we were in London, where are we going to go tonight? And we saw that John Martin was playing uh, ah at Bedford College in Regent's Park mm -hmm. in London. So we just went along there and we found the guy from the Students' Union who was organising the gig and just said, uh, can we go and can we do a little spot? And uh, he said, I'll have to ask John. So he, he asked John and John was fantastic. He just said, yeah, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour before I go on. So we did and then John really got very enthusiastic about it called up his own agent and uh, the agent arranged to meet us the next day at a club he told us to go to this club and he'd come along and see us play and uh, he became our agent then and he arranged for us uh, to go to a studio pie studios in marble arch london uh one sunday just to record some demos well <laughs> We got down there and we just set up in a circle and just, you know, whatever. We just played as we played live. We just sat in a circle. And We'd only played the first number and the kind of producer. Uh, I, anyway, I think he was quite surprised that we could just sit and play vocals, you know, the whole thing, the harmonies and everything. So uh, he just said, do you want to make an album? <clears throat> and we just said, yeah you know of course you know uh and that was it so we recorded the album that afternoon four hours it was just that was it and we went back the following sunday and four hours mixed and that was the first album you know just yeah, yeah. great experience you know we loved it you know yeah. we loved it so uh, well, and the album was pretty good i think right. you know, for the the first album uh yeah. Were, yeah. were you surprised? Were you surprised with the, how well received it was? Uh, well, not really. <laughs> it sounds terrible because I just thought we were brilliant. So, <laughs> I just, you know, I mean, that sounds dreadful, doesn't it? But uh, I, mean, I mean, what can you do if you don't think you're brilliant when you're kind of 17, 18 uh, and it's a new band and you're in a studio in London? I mean, it right. was all just amazing. So, uh, yeah. If if you don't if you don't believe in yourself, who will, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, so that's it. Then we moved down to London, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we all lived in like a a house in West London. Mm -hmm. But every we all moved in together. But everybody was married with kids except me, mm -hmm. so it was kind of a busy house. Oh, I'd imagine it was a yeah, it was quite a large house, a Victorian kind of house, but. There were a lot of people in there, you know, but it was great, great fun. It was is a kind of ironically, it was called the house was called the rest. And, the rest. Uh, there weren't much rest. No, there wasn't much. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, you know, it was just music and kids, you know, and, uh, but great, but great. Yeah. Funny. That's a, well, uh, <clears throat> do you think um, comparisons to Pentangle were fair? With, with, uh, with the well, music. I, I, I well, I don't know. What can you say? I mean, in some ways, it was two guitars, two acoustic guitars, a double bass. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a kick drummer. We just had Ted playing uh, tablas or congas and stuff. 
But uh, Pentangle played, I mean, they have a great band. I'm not saying anything negative about Pentangle at all. But uh, in fact, I'm playing now with Jackie McShee, the uh, female vocalist. Oh, okay. Now, for the last two or three years, I've been playing with Jackie. But uh, they did a lot, uh, particularly on their first albums, they did a lot of traditional mm. material and uh, Dando didn't, we didn't do any. Not that there weren't traditional influences, but all the material was our own, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and, and uh, like Jackie did a lot of the lead vocals at the time with our first album. We didn't have a female vocalist. So I don't know, you know, like people have compared us to the Pentangle. Even some people think we sound like the incredible string band. Oh, okay. which I don't think we do really, but yeah. But anyway, whatever. I mean, if people think that, uh, at least it's not somebody awful that they think we sound <laughs> less really great. So that's fine. Right. People people tend to like to do that, right? You know, have a point of reference with, with, with a band, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like so, especially if you're going to introduce them to somebody else that's never heard them. Well, it sounds like, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, I yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of understand that as well, you know, that you have to whatever to get it out there you have to try and explain so that's that's it isn't it it's a term a uh, point of reference it's a bit like and it's a bit like you know so yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well how was your uh, your guitar virtuosity early on or was that still developing at this point <laughs> at this point <laughs> <laughs> uh no well i mean you know uh yeah i could play you know i could mm -hmm. play and uh the thing the thing for me was that we uh we just played, I mean, I think, I believe that we just played so well together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the huge thing. We just kind of seemed to naturally find the gaps and the complementary bit that went with each other's music. So mm -hmm. it all kind of meshed in, you know. But yeah. I think, you know, we were uh, relatively virtuosic, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. I don't know what to say about that. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you're talking about developing, I mean, I'm still practicing on a daily basis now and trying to learn and trying to get better. It's right. just at the time, I didn't realize, you know, the old saying, I didn't realize how much I didn't know. <laughs> so I, I kind of thought I was all right, but in, in a very small area, if you like, you know, and then you just see the horizon. Oh, Oh God, you know, further and further, as you hear more music and more things, oh my God, you know, so. Uh, There's so much more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. Well, <clears throat> well um, you mentioned this earlier. In 1970, the band moved to London and added singer Polly Bolton. Now, yeah. talk, talk about what uh, her addition meant to the band. <laughs> Well, it was like a dream come true, you know, really for us. Uh, we did audition a couple of other people and mm -hmm. I'm not going to mention any names because <laughs> they are some quite well-known names. But uh, it was always like, yeah, but they're not Polly, are they? Oh. You know what I mean? It was always right. that kind of thing. Great and lovely people, not knocking anybody's vocal ability or anything. But it was always just that thing that, but she's not Polly, you know, and we just wanted Polly. But right. we were kind of a little bit frightened of her as well. Polly can be quite a ferocious uh, personality. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, she's uh, she's fantastic, fantastic, fantastic person. But we were kind of a little bit in awe of her. And, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> we we dis we knew that one one when we were living in London, we knew one year that she was going to the Sidmouth Folk Festival. It's an international uh, folk song and dance festival on the south coast of England. And uh, it's still going now, huge festival. Mm. But I, we knew she was going there. So we decided that one of us should go and have a word with her and ask her if she'd like to come to London and have a go with us and see what she thought, you know. And so we actually literally drew straws and... Uh, I drew the short straw, you the straw. so uh, yeah. I had to go down to Sidmouth and uh, 
I heard Polly singing one night just in the campsite around a campfire and uh, uh, I had a couple of, I don't drink by the way, nothing uh, religious or moralistic or anything, I just don't like it. But to go and speak to Polly, I had uh, two pints of Guinness uh, <laughs> before I went over to her and uh, I introduced myself and uh, talked about the band and said that we've, you know, huge fans and we'd like it. Anyway, she agreed to come along and, uh, and anyway, so she did, you know, a few weeks later, came to London and uh, we were all really excited. Everybody, the wives, the kids, you know, everybody were really excited. And then I'd just written a song which was on the second album, this Riverboat song. And, uh, well, I mean, I can sing it, but uh, I always thought that was one that I really thought Polly could sing that great. So that was the first song she kind of learnt and sang with us that mm. first night. And uh, it was just it, incredible. It was literally that thing when we stopped playing and Polly stopped singing, there was just this silence in the room, like this stunned yeah. silence and like nobody wanted to say anything, I don't think. Nobody wanted to break this. It was just incredible, you know. So uh, anyway, so we asked, you know, Polly, would you like to join the band? And anyway, she said yes. So we're very grateful for that. And uh, yeah, so we made the next two albums with, with Polly. Yeah. With Polly. <clears throat> and she's yeah, still yeah. singing now and uh, still making CDs and uh, I did a gig with her a couple of years ago, a festival mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, she's still awesome. I mean, yeah. just awesome. I can't tell people, you know, it's like ridiculous. You try and tell people how good she is. <laughs> she's, she's up there with the, the best in the world of any kind of music. If you're talking about a vocalist, Mm -hmm. Polly's in the top five in the world, <laughs> in yeah. my opinion. She's sensational. You're, you're not partial, I can tell, at all. No, 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 no. But the you thing know, is, it's true. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> she, um, she really is. She, she is a great, a great, and, and at times her vocals recall Joni Mitchell, I, I think. Yeah, the, she's got, you know, kind of everything in there. You know what I mean? From the trad thing to, uh, and when after Dando, I don't want to jump ahead of this interview, but we went to America and then we lived in, Amer me and Polly lived in America for three or four years and a lot of influence was, we picked up there as well, you know, mm -hmm. so she got kind of everything, you know, anyway. Okay. Just, absor just absorbing like, you know, a wet sponge, right? Yeah. 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 Well, um, you were signed to Neon in 71, yeah. and then your second album, the eponymous Dando Shaft, was released. Uh, this is the release that I have with the with the extra tracks. Is that, uh, sorry? This is the, the album that I have with the, with the extra oh, yeah, tracks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, who staged the cover photo? Talk about the... the oh, yeah. The... Well, that was a, a nothing-coming photographer at the time, a guy called Keith. K double E F, okay. and uh, he went on to great things. I mean, he was just a young guy like us, and uh, very enthusiastic. And when uh, when we knew he was doing the cover, he just rang us up and said, uh, "I want you to meet me at this place, whatever." He gave us an address, and when we got there, it was kind of in the middle of nowhere, and a disused brick factory. Ah. And, uh, kind of all falling to bits and in ruins and uh, we were there and then a few minutes later he turned up in his uh, Ford Transit truck you know and uh, he got out these uh, fairground horses and yeah, various yeah. things and put them around inside this shed mm -hmm. and then he ran around with a smoke kind of flare and uh, and then just the light coming in through the windows really picked up the right. smoke and made these shafts of light you know yeah. the obvious thing and uh yeah so he took the the it was a double a gatefold sleeve so uh yeah on the back it just opens out to a fantastic i think a great photograph you know uh, mm -hmm. you know apart from i don't mean because we're in it but i mean it's <laughs> just a great it's just a great photograph quite evocative you know with the fairground things in there and then he also came to a couple of our live gigs 
for the inside gatefold and he took those as well you know yeah I mean he went on to work with Paul McCartney and all sorts of people you know uh, so we were we met each other right at the beginning of our careers if you like yeah yeah well I don't know if you're familiar do you, were, you, were you familiar at the time with um, Fresh Maggots do you remember that band? Fresh Maggots no they uh, also used Keith. Keith did one of, well, their only album. He did their, their album cover for too. So there's that connection too. They, uh, when I heard the name, I thought it was like a heavy metal band or something, but it's actually a folk folk rock band, you know, oh, uh, right. okay. a duo, you know, the uh, early 70s, early 70s. Right. So okay. uh, yeah. I'll check them out. Yeah, yeah, Fresh Maggots. They got the name, uh, they went into a, um, a fish, uh, you know, a lure shop, you know, where they sell, right. you know, yeah, fishing yeah. and it said Fresh Maggots, you know, there was like a little ad. <laughs> Let's use that. Let's, yeah. <laughs> that was, but check out the interview on, on you know, with, uh, it's uh, Mick, oh, right. okay. yeah, okay. Mick, Mick Burgoyne, Mick Burgoyne is his name. Okay. Um, yeah. But he, he's, uh, yeah, you can, you can find that, uh, it was my two or three interviews ago, probably not, not too, too long ago. Yeah. Mick Bergman. Well, uh, critics liked the album, uh, but it wasn't commercially successful. Did, uh, Neon not really promote it or what, what happened? No, there? well, the, the, I mean, we, the first, the first album we did was on young blood records, a guy, mm. Mickey Dallin mm. and, uh, he most he'd had quite a, a quite a few uh, hit records, hit singles with yeah. various people. So I think this kind of uh, our folky thing or what our acoustic thing was a bit new to him. Uh, anyway, we we got new managers while we were down in London, and uh, they got us this deal with RCA. But Mickey Dallin uh, wouldn't let us go. He, he wouldn't release us so okay. we ended it ended up being we signed to rca but we kind of do a licensing deal uh from young blood productions so mm. i think it says on the album it's a young blood production but for rca and uh anyway rca decided they wanted to have a i don't know what you call it a progressive kind of label you know mm -hmm. because they've got rca victor you know as elvis presley and Jerry Reed, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know, I think they might have, anyway, whatever. So uh, they started this new label with a guy called Olaf Viper, and he was the, uh, the man in charge of this label. And I think they splashed out quite a bit of money, mm. and uh, that all the album, a bit like CTI in the, uh, on the jazz kind of front, the CTI record label, right. all of the covers were kind of gatefold really nice photography and everything like that but uh i don't know what happened but olaf uh after about 18 months kind of vanished hmm. and uh i don't know what happened I'd, I've, I've got no idea all i know is that there were i i don't know i think at the time there was something like eight or ten something acts on this neon label and nearly all of them, they kind of let go, but they kept Dan Doshaft and mm. put it onto RCA Victor for the, the kind of next album that we made. Okay. So uh, I don't know, I've got no idea. I and mean, this, this is kind of a point of contention because uh, we're still going through some legal proceedings as we speak with mm. Young Blood Records. So we've got no idea uh, how well or how badly the album sold we have no idea but i do know that rca kept us and let some others go you know so uh i think we did i think we were doing all right for them actually you know right. it but, sounds like, like i said i've them. got i've got nothing in writing right i've never them. had anything in writing <laughs> you know? so well i wanted to uh i want to mention a couple of three tracks on the on the album and then um, get your reaction you know to those uh, my favorite track is till the morning comes ah. uh, the only complaint is it's too short you know. ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> okay, well, that's very nice of you to say so. But uh, that that was a song I wrote for uh, Dave Cooper. His son was quite poorly. Anyway, so I, I just mm. wrote him a lullaby. It was just a, a lullaby for Selvin. That's his name. I mean, oh. he's, uh, I don't know, I think he's nearly 50 now. And, uh, you know, six foot four and massive. But anyway, when he was a little baby, he was poorly. And I just wrote a... Yeah, a little lullaby. That's all. Just for so. And it anyway, it found its way onto the album, and yeah. I think it's a, you know it's a nice track. You know, it, it works well. But yeah. as a lullaby, you know, we don't want to be a six-minute thing with an extended yeah. solo in the middle or you know, <laughs> the drum break or the bass break or anything. It's just, it's just of, a lullaby. Some know? kind of epic epic song. Yeah, you don't want to you know, yeah. go into <laughs> prog territory. No. Um, and uh, I also like your guitar on Coming Home to Me. Ah, yeah. That was essentially Mark's song, Mark and Jenkins. That was one of his, you know. Yeah. I mean, like, we credited it uh, all of, for the three albums. Well, we made subsequent, actually, kind of reunion stuff. But we just had everybody down as the writer because in the form that they evolved to or whatever, again without sounding too spinal tappy you know everybody contributed mm -hmm. in one way or another even if they didn't actually contribute uh with any kind of ideas for input but just because they were there and the the vibe changes with different people whatever so we kind of decided that everybody should have credit mm -hmm. for every you know we should just split everything and uh but it, it was essentially one of Mark's, uh, Mark's songs, you know. Yeah, and great song. And where I played that with Martin, you know, God, in up into the 2000s, whenever we got together, you know, we uh, we did like a reunion tour, not a dando, but me and uh, me and Mark, we did some gigs together in 2007, eight, mm -hmm. and we played that, you know, and it, it's just a good song, you know, just a good song. Anyway, thank you for. Yeah, yeah. You like the guitar part. <laughs> well, the the fans all these years are still uh, responsive to these songs too. I, I'd imagine. Right. They still like them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, another, the final one, Thruxton. Uh, nice instrumental. I like like the flute. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Thruxton flute. Yeah. Okay. Now that yeah, that was only put out on. I don't know where they got that from because right. da Dando Shaft. We did do a, a demo. Uh, we went to a little studio in Birmingham, 30 miles away from Cobb. And uh, we just recorded, I can't remember, four or five tracks, but very quickly and very basically. And one of them was Thruxton Flute. And uh, it was n we never recorded it in a proper studio or anything. And somehow or other, Mickey Dallin got hold of these... Uh, demos and he released them on some kind of compilation uh i've got no idea where he got them from you know because i haven't heard them for years either you know it was just some little demo that we made and uh but anyway yeah so that was an interesting thing because that was uh the it's in a five four time so mm -hmm. it was kind of good we were just getting into this asymmetric time thing and listening to a lot of bulgarian music where they have uh, all, you know, sevens, nines, elevens, whatever, you know, all lots of uh, asymmetric time signatures. So we were getting into it, you know. So that was our first little foray into uh, asymmetric times, you know. Yeah. Uh, probably one of the earlier, what you might call world music, maybe, you know. I, right. You mentioned yeah. Bulgaria. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk about, okay, and... 1972, your third album, Lantaloon, was released on RCA. What did you think about this release? What did I think about the album? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, th I think uh, my favorite album of the three is the second one, the mm -hmm. one that was on Neon. The first one I, I, I love as well, but the second one is kind of my favorite. The third one, Lantaloon, yeah. I mean, I think there's some good stuff on it for sure, but uh, I still my my favourite still the second one, you know, okay. and uh, I think that 
there were some little uh, cracks, if you like, appearing in the uh, the solidity of the band. Mm -hmm. You know, so they were just yeah. It's not as focused as the other two. You know, right. that's what I think. But it's still a good album. And uh, if you have the poster inside, they're worth a fortune. <laughs> they're right. They are, yeah. They're <laughs> worth a lot of money, those, uh, that, well, all three of them, but the particularly the third one, Lanterloon, there was a poster, you know, like a full-size kind of fold-out, wall-size yeah. poster of the band. And if you manage to get a copy with that in it, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's worth a lot of money now. You know. Wow. Something. Anyway. Yeah, so really? musically, musically not my favorite, but I still think it's a worthy album. Right, right. Okay, talk a little bit about Sun Clog Dance. Well, yeah, again, I mean, that was never really supposed to be like a studio uh, recording. Uh, really, it was, it was just a live thing we used to do at concerts <laughs> and uh, just to get the audience involved in singing a bit. Of, I don't mean nonsense. It, it's not like it's nonsense, but it, it, it's not like a, a. It's very basic musically, really right. basic. I think there's two chords in it, you know, and are just a plodding along rhythm. But the whole <laughs> idea was the chorus just to get everybody singing, and which right. we used to do. So it was kind of great fun, you know, and it was about spring and, uh, you know, the sap rising and the angels singing and the whole, you know, just having a good time in the rites of spring, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's it. So, I mean, I don't know. I think it was put out as a single, which I, I, it's beyond me. I don't know why these, I don't know who makes these decisions. It wasn't us, that's for sure, you know. It was a, it was a, it was a good time song and, and to get the audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was never up, yeah. really a, it was never really a, an album, mm -hmm. piece, if you like, you know. But again, right. see, Mickey Dallin, he has these crazy ideas. Like <laughs> on the second album, there's uh, the song called Railway, and mm -hmm. he actually put on between us recording it and releasing it, and we didn't hear it until it was a done deal, if you like. Uh, he put some kind of train noises on it. And it's like, what the hell's this? You know, <laughs> he's got this kind of train going across the stereo, you know, and oh my God, you know, we, oh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, anyway. So these people, you know, these record executives, anyway, there some, you go. Some might call that innovative, you know, and then I don't know. Uh, I don't know, it just sounded <laughs> rubbish to me. You, know. <laughs> you didn't like it. No. Um, you, you mentioned earlier a little bit about the cracks starting to appear. Uh, what were what were the reasons for the breakup? What can you kind of boil it down to? Well, I mean, it wasn't like we we didn't fall out or anything like that. It was it was just uh, you know when I mean I think I've already kind of uh, alluded to it that when we started, I mean the music was uh, for us as individuals. I'm not talking about for anybody else. But for us, it was totally inspirational. And uh, every time we picked our instruments up to play, we were just into it, loving it and uh, inspired by it and inspired by each other. But then after like three or four years of uh, living in the same house together, traveling to gigs in the same, you know, transport, whatever, just spending our whole lives together, you know, gigging, traveling, recording, whatever everything and then uh, i think it just takes its toll kind of on any relationship really you know so uh, it wasn't necessarily any kind of musical fallout or anything like that i think we just got a bit weary really you know of living that kind of life you know right. so uh, and uh, you don't recognize that at first you know like i didn't recognize it for sure i was kind of thinking what's what's different you know what why isn't it and maybe we need to go electric you know and all the you know just kind of things to try and save it but i mean i'm quite uh, proud of it in a way because uh, i think the band started and we only played uh not 
you know, not to make it in big time, you know, that would have been great, but I'm, uh, that was never the, uh, the motivation. Mm. So when it comes to that point when that's not happening, then uh, to be kind of being honest with yourselves, uh, it's just time to kind of let it go and move on and yeah right. so it wasn't any huge musical difference or or any big fallouts you know it was just that thing that the kind of magic's not happening anymore so right and so we stopped we didn't we didn't carry it on uh just for the business right we could have done you know because mm -hmm. we had great managers that they were managing some successful bands and you know we were kind of on the rise playing bigger gigs and everything else but uh, there you go anyway that's yeah, I, think, I think that's probably a good time to call it when the inspiration's not there and when it when it starts to just yeah. become a rigmarole and just a, like you said business yeah. yeah it becomes a job and a job. you know in the in the worst sense of that you know and that's not what music should be about no that's not uh, what we wanted it to be about at all you know so. well let's go up uh, you're going to switch gears here um yeah. after this you went to india for a time uh, oh, I did, talk, yeah. talk about your your time in india <laughs> yeah well you know a, around the time and around the time that kind of dando was uh slowly beginning to uh change or whatever you know there was a lot of kind of spiritual kind of things happening and uh and especially in, well, everywhere, but in, in London, you know, there were. And uh, anyway, so uh, me and Polly, we, we, we went to India and uh, the, the object was to go and stay in an ashram mm. for a, a few weeks up in northern India in the, the Himalayan foothills, you know, and uh, which we did. And we went to Delhi first but I was also a member then of this small band called the Anand Band. And uh, we, we got to play at this festival in Delhi, mm -hmm. in, in India, in the, uh, in the Ram Leela ground. So it's in the center of Delhi somewhere, but a huge, huge park. And there was a big religious festival there. And uh, we got to play, you know, we got to play a mm. few numbers on this enormous stage and just playing to a sea of people. I mean, as far as the eye could see, it was just people. I mean, it was in, in, in quite an incredible experience, you know, and very moving. I've not been to India before. I mean, I was 22 and uh, I mean, it's more common to go for people to go to India now than, you know, 50 years ago. But uh, yeah, amazing, 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 amazing. And one interesting, no, there's lots of interesting things, but one of the interesting things for me, when, when we got to the, uh, is a place called Hardwar. Okay. On the banks of the Ganges. And when we got there, I couldn't see, I mean, it might be just totally the weather, but I couldn't see the Himalayas. Mm. I knew they were there, we were in the foothills, but I couldn't see them. But at the end of, like, I was there for three weeks or a month, something. And after a couple of weeks, I could see them. I could see the mountains. So for me, that was kind of a little bit of a, oh, a little bit of a spiritual thing. I mean, right, I don't right. want to sound too deluded. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it was like, first of all, I can't see them. And then after I've been there for a while, and there they are, you know. So, uh, yeah, and I met David Laflamme there. Oh, it's a beautiful day. From It's a Beautiful Day, yeah. Mm. I was just wandering along uh, the banks of the Ganges, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so was he. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, he didn't know me from Adam, but I knew who he was because I had Dando. We were kind of big fans of uh, mm. It's a Beautiful Day, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that kind of lead electric violin, you know. Yes, yes. Which... Uh, they were yeah they were one of the first first that i heard of anyway and there was another band called flock is wow. jerry goodman violinist who later played with john mclaughlin and stuff but mm. we heard these things on the radio you know and it was like oh my god 
lead violin, you know, it was, uh, and the guys could play, you know, David Laflamme could play, you know, so, uh, and so could Jerry Goodman, of course, you know. So anyway, yes, yeah, so that was kind of interesting just to bump into yeah. David Laflamme. Who, who would have you, uh, so you came back to the, to the U.S., were you, uh, were you a changed man spiritually? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> oh God, I wish. Uh, not really. Uh, not really. I mean, I might have had different aspirations for a while, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I came back to England after that. And then, mm -hmm. I, uh, then I went to America again with Polly. With in Polly. In 73, I think it was. We went to Houston. Yes. This is when it gets, this is when it gets interesting. You joined Blue Aquarius. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. jazz funk outfit, like yeah. 50, 50 yeah. members. You know, 26 wow. piece, I think it was. Wow. I have a photograph somewhere. Can I show you a photograph? Hey, sure, yeah. Yes, yes. It's a big, <clears throat> it was a big band. This was a scrapbook that my dad kept. Oh, my great. Dad kept this scrapbook. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did. Yeah, well, I'm glad he did. Now, at the time, I didn't, I thought, what's he doing that for, you know? But now, I can appreciate it. There we go. Blue, blue Aquarius. Blue Aquarius. Where, can, can you point out where you are in that, in that picture? Uh, yeah, it's different because uh, I've got hair. Uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, there are. Uh, actually, you can't hardly see me. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Wow. Oh, you do. I can see the hair. I can see the hair. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Blue. Yeah. That Blue was on, uh, I think that was that was taken on uh, the Malibu Beach, actually. Okay. We'd moved well, they were, uh, now, the band were followers of Prim Rawat. Yeah. Founder yeah. of the, well, of the D DLM. Divine Light Mission, yeah. Yeah, we, that's, that's we were in, in, the, yeah. in the first place, but uh, we kind of got kicked out. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, but we, we, we were kind of excommunicated, but, uh, but we carried on because we were just like a band, you know what I mean? We were a band and we just wanted to play as a band as well, you know. So, uh, yeah, what can I, I don't know what to say about that really but we were initially into it and then i don't know what happened but we okay. were kind of uh kicked out you know hmm, interesting but, but you did write you did write a few songs for the blue aquarius album yeah well a couple i think i i can't remember in fact hmm. i don't think i've got that either you know it's hmm. uh i'm not very good at keeping uh, keeping records of my records you know <laughs> i gave them all to my mum and uh -huh. uh, that's how i've got some now because, yeah uh, yeah my mum kept them for me well, but that, nice. that time so we, i first went over and i was we were living in houston mm -hmm. because we we did a tour we went our first gig was up in washington dc we actually played underneath the uh, the washington monument mm. so that was kind of uh, just great gig to do, you know, just fantastic to be playing by the Washington Monument. And uh, and the tour kind of went all over the place, but ended up back in Houston, Texas. And we did three nights at the Houston Astrodome, you know, with with Eric Mercury support. Have you really? Heard Eric Mercury? Yeah. Yes, yes. He wrote some songs with Stevie Wonder and stuff, yeah. and an artist in his own right. Yeah, so... Uh, so, so that was unbelievable, you know, because at the time, I don't know for Americans, but for certainly us in in England, it was like the eighth wonder of the world, you know, the yeah. you know a covered in arena of that you could get like a hundred thousand people in a closed arena, you know, was uh, yeah. was awesome, you know. But while we were there, we did a uh, I th for us it was a really interesting thing. We did a prison tour. Mm -hmm. We played a load of prisons in uh, Texas, mm. New Mexico, and Oklahoma. You know, uh, they wouldn't let any of the women go on the tour, so the band was reduced to about sixteen people, and uh, we worked out a prison set. So uh, 
we worked out some uh, kind of soul music. We play. We learned some Santana uh, kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah. Any, anyway, so we just worked out a special prison set, you know. And yeah. when you walk out on the stage in front of a prison, and they're kind of uh, they're segregated, you know. You've got the Hispanics separate from the blacks and the the white. You know, it's all separate and you you know it's quite scary you know you walk out there in front of that kind of audience and oh yeah anyway but as Thank soon you. as we started playing we just kind of hit them straight away with some soul number some kind of funky soul thing and uh they were all giving each other five and hopping anyway they just they turned out great but for a little white english boy yeah, you know, I was 23 years old. I was kind of a bit nervous, I have to say. But it turned out great. It turned out great. I would be too. It, you mentioned uh, Santana and the, the Latin kind of sound. You played with a group called Los Bohemios. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was now, who were, that was a little bit after that. We moved yeah. to, uh, talk, to talk. Who were they? Who were they? Yeah, well, we moved to LA and mm -hmm. uh, I was first place we lived actually for about three months was uh, it was called the Garden Court Apartment Motel mm -hmm. in brackets the Magic Palace of the Stars and uh, I think in the 1920s it had been kind of where uh, Valentino, Rudolph Valentino and uh, Laurel and Hardy and whatever had stayed in these places but by the time we got there I mean it was a roach ridden dumped mm. you know what i mean it, it was right. right next door if you come out of the chinese theater you know the chinese theater yeah. on hollywood boulevard right it was next door to it it was right next door to it so it was a pretty wild place i had never experienced anything like it i mean it made hollywood boulevard made soho look like a convent or something <laughs> you know? it was wild you know <laughs> but uh, anyway yeah and uh while i was there and I've tried to think about it, this. I can't remember how I got this job in Los Bohemios. I just, I can't think how it happened. But anyway, I ended up playing, for I think about 18 months with this band called Los Bohemios de Santa Paula. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were like a, a, a Latin dance band. Mm -hmm. And the leader, the leader was an alto sax player called Carlos Mendez. Uh, the bass player was, uh, and he was from El Salvador. No, he was, sorry, he was from Guatemala. The bass player was called Nene. I don't know what else he was called, but <laughs> Nene. And he was uh, like a California uh, Hispanic, so oh. he was born there. Jose Luis was uh, the drummer. He was from Mexico City. And uh, he was what they, they call, I don't know, this is probably not, uh, very nice parlance, but he was called uh, a wetback. Okay. So he was a, he was an illegal immigrant, you know, at the time. And uh, but a great drummer. Anyway, the music I just loved it. I mean, it was raw and uh, full of energy and this Latin rhythms. So for me, I just loved it. I mean, I was loving it, just really loving it. And we we just played at Latin American clubs. You know, mm -hmm. up and down the California coast there, between LA and Santa Barbara, and yeah, it was it was just great. It was kind of wild, you know. They were wild, and we used to play, you know, uh, on a uh, Friday Friday and Saturday. You'd play from eight till two, so eight in the evening till two in the morning, and uh, forty five minutes on, fifteen off, and in the fifteen off, a mariachi band had come in. <laughs> you know, do all that. Then they go and we play. But on a Sunday, we played two till two. You know, two till so two. That's a twelve-hour shift. You know, that's a long. You know, wow. but again, it was fantastic. I, yeah. I have to say, I loved it. You know, really enjoyed it. Sounds like that you adapted real well to that. That. Yeah, I, I mean, I loved it. I, it's yeah. interesting. I had a few uh, nights where they'd be coming around the front of the stage there'd be uh, some like young guys like my age at the time in my early 20s and they'd just be kind of staring at me and giving me the kind of a little bit of the evil eye you know mm -hmm. 
Mm. And uh, when I got off, when it was our uh, 15 minutes off, and I'd go to the bar to get a drink or something, and then uh, you know a couple of them would come over and start talking to me, but kind of a little bit aggressive, you know. Yeah. But then as soon as they heard my voice, and mm -hmm. they'd say, "Oh, where are you from, man?" You know, and I say, yeah. "I'm from England." Oh, yeah. and then it all changed, you know, and then right. and, and then it, it got super friendly and right whatever you know so i don't think they liked the fact that a white american was playing right but right a white person from england they <laughs> thought was really cool you know and i i had some great friends among the hispanic community you know i mentioned in the intro uh, se your session work with alice coltrane uh one-time wife of john <sighs> yeah what do you, what do you re remember from uh oh god from working with her well i mean uh, amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. it was amazing. Uh, she just used to kind of float in somehow, just yeah. this gorgeous stillness and this beautiful presence. And uh, the band was, you know, you can imagine 26 people all in there, most of them anyway, in their kind of mid, early 20s, whatever. So there was a lot of conversations going on when we weren't playing. Everybody was, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and gassing and people come on guys shh, 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 whatever we're going to play but when alice came you could have heard a pin drop uh, everybody was just oh my god this is alice coltrane you know and never was the band so well behaved and uh, so focused as when alice came in the room you know and uh, yeah she because she was uh, i think she just signed a deal with warner brothers around this kind of mid 70s warner brothers signed up a lot of a lot of jazz artists didn't they they had benson who was i think probably their most successful but they had uh pat martino another great guitarist they had uh al Jarreau mm -hmm. signed with them anyway so an alice coltrane signed rasan roland kirk he was one of their uh, acts he signed to Warner Brothers so I think they were kind of getting into this jazzy cool whatever thing we're promoting that and uh, Alice had signed some deal with uh, with Warner Brothers but she used to come out to us and uh, because we were a big band we were kind of ready made for some of her orchestrations yeah. so she used to come out to the band we were living at Malibu gorgeous place and just overlooking the beach there and uh, amazing the guy the place where rick <laughs> anyway i can't remember his name rick reno rick uh, the producer big okay. time producer he lives there at zuma beach but okay. anyway yeah. uh yeah so she used to come out there and uh, rehearse with us and uh, it was always magnificent you know it was always just i'm not saying we were magnificent i'm just saying it was always a magnificent experience to be in the company of uh she was like a saint w what can i say it was just great a uh, fantastic we also did a a private concert for quincy jones and ray brown actually you did okay just the two of them they mm -hmm. we invited them <laughs> thinking that that's never going to happen and uh, and they agreed and they came and uh, we just set up two chairs <laughs> and uh, like a, a drinks trolley and some snacks and things and uh, we played we just played for like I don't know half an hour 40 minutes and the first thing Quincy did when he came in the room and he saw us all there he just started going like this like counting heads and then he was just laughing and he said my record label won't let me take more than 12 people on the road you know so uh, he said, you know, and he was counting the 26 but anyway and he was great you know he's great he walked around the band after we played a few numbers and he just having a little chat with everybody and yeah so that's something i'll remember yeah. you know with ray brown being there as well i think they'd just gone into business together apart mm. from being great musicians and obviously having some kind of history as musicians but right. i think they uh they went into business and quincy right. jones started a, a label didn't he q west or yes something like that anyway yes. yeah 
Yeah. Sorry, have, have I rambled on? Oh, no, that's that's fine. I wanted to talk about one more um, uh, subject, and then and then you and then if you like, you could you could play a little something. Okay. Um, cool. In 1981, you got a phone call from the manager of a vocal so a vocal soul group called Delegation, saying they needed musicians for a two week tour of Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, you jumped at the chance. <laughs> I, I did. <laughs> I did. I really did. I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, like I say, as the guy was, as the guy was talking to me, his voice turned into David Attenborough's. <laughs> so I was no longer talking to this manager. I was talking to David Attenborough. And <laughs> when he was talking about the band and going to Nigeria, I was just seeing these, the Serengeti and right. the, the wildebeest and the lions and the, everything and I was just oh my god you know when I put the phone down I said to my wife I'm going to Africa yeah and I'm wow. gonna get paid for it you right know, I'm going to Africa and you're gonna pay and you're, me to go there and you're gonna go you're gonna go on a on a safari you're gonna go on a safari right <laughs> that's yeah. that was what you were thinking it's like a safari. Nigeria yeah right right <laughs> that's what I was thinking but yeah. uh, Nigeria doesn't have big game or anything and uh, at the time i don't know you know right. but uh, it's quite it can be and it was for me in 1981 whenever it was uh, quite a scary uh, place to be mm -hmm. i was like the white boy in the band you know for a start off and, right uh, so they were you know black singers that they the three black singers they were the band really Right. delegation they were called they were the band and uh, other guys in the band had played with them before but anyway i hadn't and uh yeah off to nigeria and it was uh, yeah it was pretty scary uh, there were a few really hairy moments and uh <laughs> i don't want to say anything i don't want to say anything awful about nigeria either but uh, it was just, uh, it was fantastic to go there. I'm delighted that I've been there. Yeah. But uh, it, it was quite tough, you know, it was, it was quite tough. Uh, I don't want to say too much more. It was right. quite tough. Well, the, uh, the, the crowds were receptive though, right? I mean, were they... they the crowds they were... were amazing. I yeah. mean, and that, in, in some ways, it was part of the problem. I mean, the first gig was a, a club in uh, Calabar, in the east of Nigeria and uh, we'd finished playing and everything and we'd done the encores and uh, the singers were in charge of the band and they said right that's it now we've done the encores and blah blah finished but then the the audience wouldn't go away you know and oh. they just kept shouting for more and more and more and more but for ages I mean it's not like 10 minutes and then they dispersed they weren't going anywhere and uh, in the end, the manager of the place had to lock us in the dressing room okay. to keep the kind of crowd from getting oh. at us and called the police. And uh -huh. the police had to come and disperse the crowd. You know, it was, uh, okay. yeah, it was quite hairy. You know, they weren't very pleased with us because we wouldn't come back out again. I mean, we'd done some encores, but they just wanted more. And more. Uh, like I say, I would have gone on. We, the band would have gone on played more, but the singers, it's their, they're the bosses, and they said, "That's it. We're not going on anymore. We've done it." And uh, yeah, anyway, it was quite something. The scenes in that place were quite something, you know. <laughs> I can imagine what an experience. What? Well, it, it uh, was amazing. It was really amazing to be, uh, and you know, a bit of a lifetime's ambition as well. You know, I. I wanted to go to India. I'd done that, and I wanted to to go to Africa, and play, and uh, I did. So great, yeah, it's great. You made the rounds. Yes, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, at this point, do you want to uh, pick up your guitar and and play a little something? Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is one I prepared earlier. Mm -hmm. This is my uh, guitar from Tyler, Texas. Yes, from Tyler. Yes, and I, yeah. it's a, and I it's said a, that a, that brought yeah. back a lot of memories because I lived there when I was a little yeah, boy. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, that's something. Amazing. And uh, it, the guitars are Taylor. Okay. But a Taylor from Tyler. 
<laughs> Can you see that? Yes, I see the I see the brand Taylor. on there. Yeah, That's Taylor. Taylor. So how is? Can you hear it? Okay. Yeah. And can you still hear me talking over the top? Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay. So I'll. Uh, I hope this goes well. If it doesn't go well, we can edit it, can't we? Yeah. And do it again or something. Yeah, do it again. Okay. I'm going to do the one I did. Anyway, this is uh, leaving in a hurry blues. Okay. <laughs> Got his spine right in line. He's got good company. He's walking a fine line in his downtown. Learning a thing or two. Didn't want to lose her. No, he didn't. Comes down to hurting someone so bad that you hope they find the one way done. Didn't want to lose her. No, he didn't want to choose. The boy got tired of losing. He's leaving in a hurry. Got his spine right in line. He's got good company. He's walking a fine line in his downtime. Learning a thing or two. Get a bump to lose her. No, he did.
All right. All right, Kevin. So you become long lasting friends with that guitar. I can tell. Oh yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> it's a lovely, it is yeah. a lovely guitar. And it was this it was this business that they, mm -hmm. they still make this guitar, but they mm -hmm. changed the whole pickup system. Okay. I mean it's not gonna make any difference when I'm playing acoustically, but right. when I'm on stage and I plug it in, right. This is a this is a really nice control box if you like. Box there. And wow. uh, they yeah. they That's stopped a... using this one in 2002 yeah. and i don't like the new ones you know. the new one yeah anyway a nice really really nice sound and um your fingers are still very nimble you know <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah yeah well, yeah well it's and, nice uh, of you to say so yeah but, uh... yeah um and 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 you 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 got strong strong pipes also your your voice is still i mean it's very strong coming across okay, well that's yeah yeah I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. When you went back to England, what was the first band that you uh, you were you were involved with? After my time in America, yeah, mm -hmm. it was uh, well. I wasn't in a band. First of all, I just started playing. Me and Polly were just playing around folk clubs, you know, okay. just the folk clubs. So we did that for a while, and then I uh, I did I joined a band called Side Effect. Okay. And. Uh, it was kind of like a the jazz funk band, you know, that kind of keyboards, Fender Rhodes player, two guitars, bass and drums, and some vocals, you know. But we were a more instrumental band than ever. But that's when we got to work with Percy Sledge. Uh, okay. And the Marvelettes. The Marvelettes. So we, we were like the backing band for Percy Sledge. When a man loves a woman. Yeah. Well, that, you know, played that every night for a while. And uh, many times, actually, he used to play it for about 10 or 15 minutes, the last number that he played, and it went on and on, and Percy would go off, and then he'd come back on and take a bow and sing another chorus and go off and come back on and sing it again, and we <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and I love you, everything, you know. Wow. Uh, so anyway, he was quite a character, Percy Sledge, and the Marvelettes were fantastic. We mm -hmm. had a great time. I was with them for about 18 months, you know. Mm, okay. And uh, that was great. Anyway, so that was Side Effect. And then I joined a band uh, called Pizzazz. Okay. P Z A double Z. And that, again, that was kind of a, a funk outfit with guitar, bass, drums, keyboard, and sax, you know. And uh, yeah, so it was a good band, you know, doing all original material. And. Uh, yeah, very worthy. I mean, some great musicians in that band, you know. I mean, I, I felt quite, uh, well, I, 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 I didn't feel it. I was quite humbled, you know. They were great musicians, you know, really great musicians. And then uh, that took me up to 83, and mm -hmm. that's when I had the phone call from Dave Swarbrick. Okay. Uh, and the complete change of uh, musical idioms or whatever you know yeah and uh whippersnapper sorry whippersnapper yeah that's when rip yeah i mean i didn't know it was going to be whippersnapper i just had a phone call from swab saying would you like to come over for a blow a play so mm -hmm. uh i went over and uh we just played a couple i mean i'd met him before but i didn't really know him you know i I just said hello at a couple of festivals or something, you know, that was about it. But uh, we played a couple of numbers together and uh, he said, yeah, you know, Kev, I reckon we can swing. I'll get, <laughs> it, get it, that's what he said. I reckon we can swing. And then he told me that he'd already asked Martin Jenkins ah, uh, okay. from Dando Shaft. Dando, yeah. he'd already, Martin was already gonna be in this band and there was a fourth member called Chris Leslie Mm -hmm. who I'd never heard of at the time, but uh, was a violin mandolin player and uh, fantastic, fantastic player. And he's now in Fairport. Well, he's been in Fairport for the last 26 years, I think, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, you know. Uh, anyway, so we it was just me and Swab had that little go together, but I know that he'd already asked Chris and he'd already asked Mart. I was like the last person 
that he asked and uh, he was just checking me out you know when he said come for a blow really it was uh, come for an audition mm -hmm. but he didn't say it like that and he didn't kind of feel like that but that's what it was he was just seeing if I could cut it you know yeah and, uh, anyway so it was great so we had a that was the start of Whippersnapper which lasted for I don't know it it lasted 12 years actually 12 years not all of those with Dave. Dave left in about 1990. You know, mm. he had a bit of a falling out with somebody in the band, and blah de blah de blah. Anyway, and then I picked up playing with him. He went off. Uh, he went off to Australia. Swarb did to live, and he came back in about 1997, something like that, 98, and we started playing together again as a duo. With the uh, the idea of it becoming we were going to call it COFA because COFA because some people think that Coventry comes from the words COFA's tree oh okay. the tree of somebody called COFA COFA so okay. tree. interesting I don't know whether this is true or not but I mean it goes back you know Coventry is a really really old place a really old city uh, city now but uh, and I think it was kind of by this tree that the, they started kind of markets or some kind of things going anyway the idea was that we were called Kofa and we could have other members in if we wanted to so we could go out as a duo but we could also go out as a three piece or a four piece or whatever you know mm -hmm. so that was the plan but then uh, Swarb got really ill on one of our me and Swarb, just after he got married, uh, we went off to Austria in 1999. And during that tour, he got really ill. And uh, yeah, and then that started the next, well, from 1999 to 2004. I mean, he was in and out of intensive care. Is that what you call it in America? Like yes, intensive, intensive care. Intensive care. So he was in and out of intensive care. And they were going to actually let him go at one point. Mm -hmm. I was in there visiting him with his wife and uh, a whole team of doctors came in and looked at, they asked us to leave and they, they were alone with him. And then they came out and the kind of the consultant, that's like the head doctor who you don't call doctor anymore. You call Mr. He's okay. kind of, of transcended being a doctor. He's a Mr. again. And he said that this has happened so many times. If it happens again, uh, we, we're going to do a DNR, a do mm. not resuscitate. Okay. So we're going to let him go, you know. And first of all, with me and Dave's wife are going, yeah, okay, okay. And then it's like, wait a minute, what, what did you just say? Right. You're going to let him go, you know. So we just went apeshit, you know. We went ballistic, you know, at this point. And uh, he was like, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so he said, give me a few minutes. And he went off, saw the registrar of the hospital, and he said, okay, we're, we're going to give him one more chance. We're going to send him to Papworth Hospital, who's a specialist heart and lungs hospital. They'll do some tests on him. And if, he's, if the rest of him is strong enough, they'll uh, see if he can, they can do a, a lung transplant. Mm. And he went to the hospital, Pat with hospital, they did the tests, and yes, he was. they reckoned he was strong enough, mm. and they were right. And uh, it was just incredible, because three days after he came out of Patworth, when they said he could undergo it, he'd be put on the waiting list, three days later, he got the call. We've got lungs, come now. You know, come now, like this second. And... Uh, and that was midnight on the Friday, I remember. And uh, anyway, so that was it, eight hours and a uh, new pair of lungs, you know. New pair of lungs, wow. Yeah, incredible. I think, I think we could all use, we could all use that <laughs> new pair of lungs. Yeah. <laughs> so I a, li I yeah, a, little, a little interesting, a little interesting, a kind of humorous side note to that, though, is the, the, the newspaper, the paper, that jumped the gun and re and reported his obituary. <laughs> yeah, indeed, that's right. 
and it was the Daily Telegraph, so uh, one of the broadsheet, one of the big newspapers, <laughs> rather right wing, I have to say. But uh, yeah, and Swab was delighted right. when he read it because he was he was uh, saying, I, I wondered for one thing, it, would I get an obituary, and uh, if I did, would it be a good one? You know, so it was like uh, a third of a page of a broadsheet newspaper with a photograph and a fantastic write-up so he was made up you know he was really lovely about it and first of all actually he tried to sue the telegraph uh -huh. because you know he said for loss of earnings people aren't going to book me now they think I'm dead, you know, <laughs> that he's dead all this kind of thing. but they just said they just said well sue us then right that was right. their answer well go ahead sue us so what dave did his little uh get back at them was uh, he just had hundreds of these obituaries printed off mm -hmm. and he used to take them to gigs and sell them <laughs> he would sell a signed copy of his obituary right. yeah and, uh, there's not many people that can do that you know that's what i was gonna say nobody can read their own obituary you know and um, he signed I mean, it you know so yeah. so that, he made something out of it you know he, he was made great at that making yeah. something out of, something, it's great he has a he has a good ha, he had a good sense of humor yeah, yeah gosh, sure he did yeah he so did. did that inspire swarb's lazarus yeah i think so so it yeah. was like uh i mean when he had that operation in 2004 i mean i mean god it was it's tough, you know, tough. I went to see him. I was the, the first person, except for his wife, who saw him in the hospital. And uh, when I got there, this is only like a, a day or so after, he was sitting out of bed, but he was connected to a bank of machines. I mean, it looked like a recording studio behind oh. him. And he, he'd actually, this is no word of a lie, he'd got 22 machines that he was hooked up my, to my goodness just unbelievable he got these kind of shunts you know where they're they're forcing some kind of liquid into him mm -hmm. but over a period of hours so it's all mechanized he just got things everywhere going in him out of him it, it mm. was unbelievable mm. and actually when he saw me i don't think there are not many people if any who've seen swarb cry okay but when he, when I walked in to the ward, he burst into tears, you know, and you're just like, Kev, you know, I, I uh, don't know what he, what he must have gone through, you know, in the sure. build up to the operation, you know, I mean, that's, you know, take a saw and, you know, I can't oh, anyway, so uh, I think it was just such a relief, you know, and everything there he was sitting up and uh, yeah, amazing. Mm. And yeah, and then, but for a, for a long time, I mean, he couldn't even pick his violin up. Mm. He hadn't got the strength to pick the bow up. You know, he couldn't do it, you know. And uh, I just used to go around and, why don't, I live close. I live close to where we live. I could walk down there in less than 10 minutes, you know. And uh, I'd just go around with my guitar, just in case, just in mm -hmm. case he wanted to have a little play. But always kind of encouraged him to keep going Dave you know and anyway whatever so uh yeah he started playing again just sitting up in bed and getting it together and uh and then he said uh, he'd like to he wanted to start a band and go out and he wanted to uh, have Martin Alcock in the band you know mm -hmm. so that was it that was the start of Swarb's Lazarus you know very aptly named band you know really and uh you your only release was live and kicking, right? From 2006. Yeah, yeah the yeah, we just, live, re live recordings. Yeah, yeah we did the. Uh, it was the first gig we did. No, it was actually, it was the second gig we did. It was going to be the first one, but then a good friend of ours, a woman called Jenny Parsons, she rang me up and said, uh, "I know that you're going to start gigging with Lazarus." Uh, can I have the first gig, please? The tour was already booked and the first gig was going to be the one we did the recording at. But Jenny said, please come and play my club first. Oh. I want mine to be the first 
of Swarve coming back, you know. So we did, and that was a phenomenal night. And when we walked onto the stage, I mean, the audience applauded for about 10 minutes. Not us, not me or Mark, they applauded Swarve, you know, that here yep. he was, you know, after all that illness and years and years mm. and double lung transplant, and there he was playing, you know. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, we only did make the one album. Yeah. Yes, and it, it is sad that both Dave and Martin have passed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I was at Martin's funeral a few uh -huh. years ago, and yeah, very sad affair, really. And Swarb didn't have a funeral. Okay. He did mm. a David Bowie on us, you know. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah, he just said no, no funeral, nothing. Yeah. Not even his wife went to his burial. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. He just so, so he he had the last joke. He had he had the last yeah, laugh. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah, he did for sure. You know. Yeah. Well, anyway. well, uh, talk. How did you meet? Let's talk about Joe Broughton. Broughton. Oh. Broughton. How do you pronounce Broughton. it? Broughton. Broughton. Let, yeah. Let's talk about how you met and uh, you've you've worked a lot of years together. Yeah. Well, yeah. Joe, uh, I met, I was in Whippersnapper and we'd just come back from Portugal. We'd just done a little tour in Portugal and we had to go straight from Portugal up to a gig in the north of England. Uh, what's it called? Burnley in a town called Burnley and mm -hmm. Burnley Mechanics. That was the name of the venue. And uh, Anyway, we played there, and uh, Joe was there with his mum. And apparently, they'd been to lots of whippersnapper gigs, but I didn't know that they mm -hmm. did. But at this one gig at Burnley Mechanics, Joe was 13, and uh, his, his mother came up and said, oh, I'm whatever, Sandra Broughton, and uh, this is my son, Joe, and he plays the violin. <coughs> and... Uh, and whatever, so we were just talking, oh, hello, Joe, you know, how nice to meet you and everything. And then I can't remember exactly how the chat went, but we talked for a bit. And then I, Chris Leslie was there. So I said, Chris, give Joe your violin. Let's let him play or something. And uh, he did. And he was just awesome. <laughs> I can't tell you how fantastic he mm. was <laughs> for a 30, well, not, not even for a 13 year old, just as a violinist, you know, forget about how old he was. It was just fantastic, you know, fantastic playing. I remember, I remember saying to Chris, you know, you'll have to watch it now, Chris, you know, he's, <laughs> he's on the block, you know. Right. And then, and that was kind of pretty much it until uh, about 10 years later. And then Joe just rang me up. Joe had moved down. He was living in Chester in the north of England. He moved down to Birmingham to go to the conservatoire in Birmingham. And uh, anyway, so he just rang me up and said, uh, hi, Kev, uh, could I come over? And we just have a little knock, you know, we just have a little play. So, yeah, OK, of course, great, you know. So we did that thing. He, he came over and we just we started off, actually, which is kind of ironic because we didn't actually play that much of it, but we played a, a few traditional Irish tunes, you know, a couple of reels and a couple of jigs, and uh, it was just fantastic. It was just that feeling, a bit like the Dando feeling or the yeah. whippersnapper feeling. It was like, oh God, this is this is really happening, you know, this is really something. Yeah. And uh, so we, yeah, shall we try and get some gigs, you know? So we anyway, that's what we did. We tried to get some gigs. We went off to, uh, we decided we wanted to make an album and uh, kind of we worked out some material. But then we thought the best thing is to go, to go away and record it, like not record it at home or not record it in Birmingham or Coventry or anything. Let's go away so we can just focus on it for, yeah. you know, whatever, without any family interruptions or any, anything, you know. So... I've got a good friend in Denmark who got a studio in his house, a basement studio, but good place. And uh, Knut Blond, his name is Knut Blond, in Fredericia. So uh, we went there and we spent a week there and we just uh, recorded it, engineered it ourselves, you know, just in Knut's mm. studio. 
And uh, that was Every Other World. That's what that album's called, Every Other World. It's one of the tracks, it's called Every Other World. And that was it. That, that, that was the start of us, you know, playing together. Yeah. And we're still playing together now. Not all the time. I mean, back in those early 20, the, what do they call them? The noughties. Yeah. In the I early 2000s, uh, right. we were touring a lot, a lot, you know. But now we're, we're kind of doing different things, but still playing together. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I imagine it was really uh, cool to see him grow up too uh, along the way, you know. Well, yeah. You know, that's as right. a young as a young man, and then you know, follow yeah. his pro progress. Well, that's right. I think he's. I think he's getting on. I don't know. I think he's forty-eight or something like this now, getting on for fifty. But on yeah. a musical level, mm -hmm. he was never a child. Right. I don't think he was ever. A, a musical child <laughs> he was always uh, amazing uh, yeah. I, I don't know I've gotten I, I can't tell you how you know res how much respect and uh, whatever I've got for Joe as a musician he's awesome he's right. awesome uh, you know as a composer a ranger a violin player a guitar player I mean he's a fantastic guitar player he's an amazing mandolin player he can play piano you know, he, thank God he doesn't sing. <laughs> but, but he's he, he's just an awesome musician, an yeah. awesome. And uh, not only is he an awesome musician, what makes it extra special for me, he's just a he's a great human being. Mm -hmm. And he's not uh, full of himself. Uh, I don't right. know if you use that phrase. Yes, yes. Do you know what I mean? He's not. Yeah. The great Joe Broughton, not at all. He's a very humble, humble, beautiful soul. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's. There you go. There I you think go, you, Joe, if you listen to this, <laughs> I think you've you've met quite a, a few that would probably be classified in that category through, throughout your years too. You know, yeah, really well, good people. I, I have met some amazing, amazing, amazing players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. Um, I wanted to next. I wanted to talk about Ish Kadur. Oh, Ish Kadur, and I want to thank you for right. for the for the uh, CD that you sent me. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and I com commented on that. Really, really good stuff. Really, um, the violinist. What is what is her name again? Yeah, Anna Esselmont. Yes, yes. She she's not Great. the violinist on the first track. Oh, okay. She's the very first track. That's Joe Broughton. Okay. Oh, is yeah. that right? Okay. But on all the others, all the others, all the others, it's uh, Anna. Yes, yeah, she's a fine fiddle player. You know? Right. I don't know what she's doing now. I don't know if she's playing. Yeah. I don't but... know what she's doing. Cormac, the percussionist, is phenomenal. Yes. And it's another one of those phenomenal musicians, and uh, and a lovely man. You know. I so, didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know what to expect when I before I listened to that, but it. It really was all great quality, you know, music. Yeah, and jo Joe produced the album. Okay, okay. Joe brought the, it was just one of those. We wanted to make an album, and uh, I, it was my suggestion that uh, because I was working with Joe as well, I didn't want to uh, just take work away or time away from Joe. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, okay, well, let's get Joe to produce it. So, yep. uh, and he did a great job, you know, yeah. he did a great job. So. The sound is really clear, crystal clear. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah I want to thank you. One of Joe's qualities, <laughs> he's a great producer, you know. I want to thank you for, for turning me on to that. I want to thank you for that, too. Yeah. Right. For, for, for turning me on to that. Okay. <laughs> to, to their music, for, for sending me that. I want right. to thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, let's. Let's move on to um, accordionist Karen Tweed. How did, how did you meet? How did you meet up? We met up. Uh, well, I, I'd met Karen at gigs, but again, just you know, you meet lots of, and you just kind of hi, Karen, and she, you know, hi Kev. But that was about it, you know. But then we were doing some teaching up at uh, in Durham, mm -hmm. at this company called Folkworks. So they ran summer schools, you know. And we were both there teaching one year, and uh, 
anyway so we met and we were chatting and then we just said look whatever we just had a little play together and we just thought wow this is this is great you know I mean she's a fantastic player Karen and uh, she's been all Ireland champion you know all that kind of thing uh, okay. she's not Irish but she has been all Ireland champion you know so uh, anyway so we, I don't know what to say we just had a play together and thought this is great let's let's start doing some gigs so we did some gigs together but also when we were up at Durham another year we met a, a singer Caroline Robson mm -hmm. a traditional singer from the northeast of England and a fantastic singer again and beautiful person so we started a trio and uh, I, I kind of I think it was just alphabetical yeah Dempsey Robson Tweed I mean we didn't know what to call it so we just called it Dempsey Robson Tweed and uh, yeah we made one album which uh, again a, a really nice album and we made it because we were we'd been booked to, to go to Australia to play at the National Folk Festival in Australia mm -hmm. and uh, just before we went Karen was taken quite seriously ill mm -hmm. I don't want to yeah. go into it but it was quite serious enough so that she was advised not to fly or or whatever and really she took a step back for a couple of years maybe a bit longer so she didn't play for a while so uh, so that was the kind of the end of that trio if you like we tried it with a couple of other accordion players didn't really happen so uh, so that was it but Karen fantastic player fantastic yeah utmost yeah. respect great player right uh, Rosie Carson you, now you knew her father for years yeah that's how I got to know Rosie uh, I met Stephen his wife Sue uh, they used to come to England every year they were both teachers so they had the big summer holidays and they'd come off and come to England go around all the festivals and I met them uh, I was playing at Cambridge and we were just checking into the same hotel together mm. I, I was just checking I was at reception and Steve was standing behind me with with his wife Sue and we just started talking and hey oh, oh wait a minute you know and you know Swab and I know Swab and blah de blah de blah and uh, and that was it anyway so that was the start of our that's how we met and when I uh, Rosie wasn't around then Rosie wasn't born and uh, we toured America whippersnapper and we played in Cincinnati that's where they're from and we played just across the river in Kentucky and uh, anyway so later on in the uh, in the late 90s and the t early 2000s I was going back to I didn't go to America for about 10 years or something from the late 80s to the late 90s but anyway I started going back in and I always used to go to Cincinnati and stay with Steve and Sue and by this time they'd had Rosie and uh, yeah I mean I think I've known her since she was like a toddler you know a tiny little girl but yeah. when she was six I think through Steve's influence he was so into the British folk and the folk rock scene she started playing uh, fiddle mm -hmm. and going to the Riley School of Music in Cincinnati every Saturday morning and learning Irish tunes and uh, mm -hmm. everything and I did some house concerts for Steve as well in various lineups on my own with Joe with uh, who else with Peter Knight you know yeah whatever so I did a few times and uh, sometimes Rosie and her friend when she was about 10 or 12 she'd got a friend uh, Simone I can't remember Simone Westerkamp that was her name and yeah. Simone and uh, Rosie would either play a couple of little tunes you know to open the concert or sing a couple of songs and anyway so they were getting good you know and Rosie was getting good but she was more of a violinist than a singer in those early days and then uh, I was over there I'd been over on my own I was doing some gigs and I was back in Cincinnati staying with uh, Steve and Sue and having a play with Rosie we were playing some tunes 
And mm. I don't know whether it was, I don't know who it was, whether it was Steve or Rosie or me or somebody said, why don't you make an album? You know, you're here, Kev, why don't you make an album? So, yeah, why don't we? Why, mm. why not, you know? And uh, so we used to rehearse a song, you know, and, uh, and then Rosie was still at school. She was 18, but at high school or whatever. The Cincinnati School of Performing Arts, I think, that, or Creative Arts, Cincinnati School of, I, I don't know where, I think it's Performing Arts. Anyway, that's, that was her high school. And uh, during the, the, we decide what song or what set of tunes we wanted to do. So while Rosie was at school, I'd be learning it and kind of doing an arrangement or trying to get something together. And then in the evening, we'd go to the studio and record what we'd been learning and then do the same the next day. Okay. So we just kept going in the evenings for a week or so. And, uh, and we did the first album, yeah, The Salty mm. Diamond. Which is a line from uh, a song, a traditional song we did called "The Bay of Biscay." Okay. And Ro I've heard this song, "The Bay of Biscay." It, it was the last song that we recorded for that first album. And uh, I was just, we need one more song, Ro Rosie. We need one more song. You must know. Come on, what do you know? And <laughs> she said, "Well, what about this one?" And uh, she said, "It's the Bay of Biscay." Well, I've heard the Bay of Biscay. Uh, lots of times and it's not one of my favourites but Rosie sang this version I've never heard it before I've no. never heard the version that wrote and it, I just thought it's beautiful I still think it's a beautiful beautiful track yeah. and uh, anyway my it's about uh, it's like the lover's ghost you mm -hmm. know uh, so this ghost comes okay. William this woman's love William goes off sailing somewhere you know he's going around the bay of biscay but he drowns but his ghost comes back mm. and visits her and the second line of the song is the first line my william sailed on the salty diamond so ah. i don't know to this day i've looked it up if the salty diamond was a ship right you know, the name of a ship or whether it was kind of some euphemism for the sea you know ah. the sun shining on the sea Right, right. Diamond. I don't know. I, I've tried to find out, but I can't. That so would be interesting I, to find yeah, that and out. I just, we didn't know what to call the album, but the Salty Diamond, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. so that's what it was. <laughs> well, and she's I, a fantastic, uh, fantastic singer, a lovely, lovely, well, she's a woman now. I think she's 30 now, got to be something like that. And she lives in Glasgow, just outside Glasgow, with a, a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, up there, yeah, Alan, and she's married to him. Uh -huh. And we played, we played for a few years. Uh, we made three albums, did some touring. We did the tour support for Fairport in mm -hmm. 2015, which was a great honor and a uh, great tour. Loved it. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned this earlier, uh, Jackie McShee. McShay or McShee? Mc... She. Is it Mc... Okay, McShee. Jackie McShee. And, uh, you guys released an album in 2020 from there yeah. to here. Yeah. Yeah, we That's... did, yeah. Uh, what's it called, From There to Here? Right, and, from uh, there. Yeah, it was just one of those. I, again, I'd met Jackie a few times, either at Fairport gigs because uh, she's the... Jerry uh, Conway, the drummer of Fairport, is their partners, mm -hmm. her and Jackie. So quite often at a Fairport like the Fairport tour, Jackie was there at a few of them. So I, I'd never played with her, but I, you know, we knew her well enough to have a chat and say hello and everything. And then I was playing at the, the New Forest Folk Festival one year on my own, and Jackie was there with Pentangle the mm -hmm. day before. And uh, I got a phone call two days before saying that somebody in Pentangle was ill, couldn't make it. And as I was there, anyway, would I play with Pentangle? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I said yes, but I've got no idea. Uh, I've never played any Pentangle stuff. And to be perfectly frank, I hadn't listened to any for a long time. So I didn't know anything about the sets, you know. 
but uh, it was Jerry who rang me and, uh, and Jerry he, just, he just sent me uh, yeah. 12 mp3s and said this is the set and this is the order uh, so learn them yeah. so I got two days and then on the the first note that I played with them was when the guys, the MC said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Pentangle. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I was on and we had no, nothing, no rehearsal time, not one note, you know, it was just. Right. But the good thing was, of course, there were four of them that did know everything. It wasn't reliant on me. You. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, if, if yeah. it had been reliant on me, wow that would have been a different story but they all kind of knew it it was just the guitar player so i just had to do those bits so it wasn't it was stressful i have to say but it wasn't it didn't fall apart because i didn't know it you know right. what i mean or if i made a mistake it wasn't going to fall to bits they knew it well you know. right. anyway so that's it and then a, a couple of weeks after jackie rang me and asked me she was going up to Glasgow to Queen's Hall to do a gig and she said would I go with her just the two of us go as a, a duo you know and so I said yeah great and anyway it was really lovely we got on well as people and uh, the music sounded good you know uh, whatever so uh, I don't know how that came about but we decided we'd go out as a duo you know we'd make an album and uh, and we did, uh, but it, it was just one of those unfortunate things that I think it was about four or five days after the album came out, uh, the country was put in lockdown. Lockdown, right. So that mm. was it then, all gigs. And then for the next two years, it was just a disaster, you know, just cancellations. You know, you're out, you're okay. Then you're all in lockdown again, then you're out, then it's lockdown and... Mm, anyway yeah. so we're working on another album now you know and we'll be looking we've been to italy a couple of times in this last few years but uh the last two years we've been three times but we're gonna go again anyway we're, we're looking to be touring next year 2023 mm -hmm. get the new album sorted ah. yeah. did you did i ever mention to you i don't know whether you want to edit this in or out or whatever but did i mention to you i played with mary black no, and I would. I had a note to ask about that, um, if we had it just time. Might be but... worth a mention. That's yeah, it. yeah. It's yeah. it's round about the Ishkador time. I think it was two thousand and three or four. Okay. And she was part. She was part of uh, the Black family. They they had a whole. The, the, was it... Yeah, the Black family yeah. with right. Francis Black, a sister and brothers, and and she was also uh, when I first saw Mary live it, I was playing at the same festival actually a festival Tuna festival in Denmark mm -hmm. and she was with Didanen oh okay okay so, but they had she had uh, there was she had, they had two singers then they had in the band that played at Tuna festival it was Mary Black and Dolores King they were both in the band it was spectacular mm, that would be something though. it was fantastic but you're talking about 1989 or something like that you know it was a long mm -hmm. time and then i did meet mary very briefly not that mary would have remembered but we were on the didanon and whippersnapper were on at cambridge one year so we kind of said hello you know but that was about it really and then in 2000 i can't remember 2003 2004 i had a phone call from mary's manager mm -hmm. i think it's her husband i think anyway and uh, he said, Mary's going to America next right. year. We need a guitar player. Uh -huh. Mary's regular guitar player is playing with uh, Sha Shannon, Sharon Shannon and in Australia. They're off to Australia when this. So would you be interested in doing the tour? Well, again, you know, herds of wildebeest. Not exactly wildebeest, <laughs> but uh, we go to America. But uh, it was that thing. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I, oh yeah. So I went over and we had a couple of rehearsals in Dublin. Uh, first of all, just me and Mary and the keyboard player, a, mm -hmm. a man called Pat Crowley, mm -hmm. sensational, fantastic keyboard player and singer. 
an accordion player. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely man. I really a uh, lot of respect for Pat Crowley. Great. And, wow. uh, and then eventually with the whole band, mm -hmm. and it was at one of the rehearsals that, that Mary heard that song I did on an album with Joe Broughton, Once I Loved, on the second album. Mm. Mm, okay. It's an Irish traditional song called Once I Loved. And Mary said to me, was that you singing Once mm. I Loved? And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I, it was actually. It and was. She said, well, I really like it. Can yeah. you sing it as a duo mm -hmm. on this tour, you know? And I was just completely blown away, you know, that I was going to be, uh, and that's what happened. So I sang the first verse and we both sang the chorus. Mary sang the second verse. We both sang the chorus. I sang the third verse and we both sang the chorus. Okay. Just with the guitar and I think a little bit of Pat Crowley on keyboards. So, and that was six number every night of the tour, I remember. It, it was always a you remember that yeah. and one of the, I think I don't know whether it was the first gig or the second gig but Mary was talking to the audience and uh, the, the, all of the, the the drummer the bass player went off and it left me and Mary and the, the keyboard player and uh, she said oh you might notice people who've seen before that this is not our usual guitar player and this is Kevin Dempsey here he's been with us for a few nights now and blah 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 and uh, she, she mentioned the song and then she said, and Kevin's going to tell you all about it. Well, I, you know, nobody has in the band ever said a word to the audience. But so when she said that, I was like, oh my, she didn't say I'm going to get you to introduce it or anything. But anyway, so I was quite uh, <laughs> nervous and shocked by it. But the thing is, I heard that song and this is what I told the audience. I heard it when I was playing at the Shetland Festival. You know mm -hmm. the Shetland Islands in the north, yeah. Yeah. whatever in the North Sea, and uh, anyway, I heard it, and I asked the guy who I heard sing it, and he said that he heard it sung by the Black family. Oh, okay. So when I was on, Mary said to me before we were on stage that uh, she said it sounds familiar, but I just don't know. Where, but anyway, so when I was on stage and she said that, you introduce it. And I told them about me being in Shetland and I asked the guy if he, if he minded, first of all, if I sang it and where did it come from? And he said that it, he got it from the Black family. So I told that on stage and Mary had heard that for the first time. So she <laughs> was really surprised in uh, everything. You know. Anyway, that was a great honour. And I've, I've actually got that recording. You maybe edit this out, but I, I could send it to you. Just okay. the track of me and Mary singing. Yes, the, the yes, I would we, like that. I would we, like. We played at the Berkeley School of Music, one of the gigs on the tour, and mm -hmm. I don't know why, but he gave me a CD of that gig, and I've okay. got. Uh, so I'll get the Mary thing and send it to you. No yeah. big deal, but it's just for me. Yeah. It's a big deal because yeah. it's with Mary Black, you know. Yeah, are you? Uh... Are you familiar with her song, Mary's Ellis Island? Yeah, we played oh, it. Oh, that's, that's, that's a wonderful song. Yeah. We played that every night, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, we yeah. did the first set kind of acoustic-y. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was with congas, double bass, you know, accordion, sometimes a little bit of Fender Rhodes or whatever, you know, a keyboard. But a set, And then in the second set, it would be drum kit, electric bass, you know, whatever. It just went up a notch, you know, yeah. in the second set. But we played that song for sure every night, you know. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful Great song. I love it. Oh, it is. It is. And she's Very a emotional. lovely person. She's a lovely, lovely, lovely person. So I'll get that in, just in case yeah. you're Mary. <laughs> yeah. Well, put in, If you, are you still in touch with her? No, not really, no. no. I mean, no. for a couple of years, you know, you might send a Christmas card or something. But right. she's retired now. I believe. Right. I think she might well, do the odd gig, but I think she's that, essentially retired. You know. That would be that would be interesting to do an interview with her. Well, one one last thing, um, okay. is if you weren't busy enough, you you've taken time out for tutoring, guitar playing, and songwriting. Do you do you enjoy that? Uh, yeah, uh, I've also done it for uh, like a mixed instrument. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so people turn up with accordions, flutes, violins. Oh, okay. Uh, cajons, you know, guitars, mandolins, cello, anything. And uh, we just work on a piece of material and get a nice arrangement. That's what I love doing more than the guitar. Is I that right? I much okay. prefer that to, yeah. I mean, I get it. Uh, I, I don't know. I just, I wouldn't say I get fed up with it, but uh, I'd sooner teach the mixed instrument, you know, not teach yeah. it, but work with people and get an arrangement together. Right. Than just work out technique for guitar or what scale goes with what chord or right. yeah, whatever. You know, yeah. I just preferred when a whole band's playing, you know. Right. I think I would think that would be a little bit that'd be rewarding. Rewarding it's work too. It's yeah. it's lovely. It's yeah. really great. I I love it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um we're we've come to uh pretty much the end of I think what we can talk about. Did you wanna did you wanna play us another song um to okay. to take us to take yeah, us yeah. I'll yeah. Pl- I'll play you uh that other one. That was one of mine. Okay. That leaving in a hurry blues. And uh, I thought I should maybe play a traditional one. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I'll that play sounds, you a that, traditional song. That sounds good. Okay, so Lord Franklin. Yeah? Yes.
Very good. So, all righty. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And no worries, uh, Greg. I mean, thank you for doing it again. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No problem. No problem. I, I want I want you to be happy. I said that, but I want you to be pleased with it. Yeah. Well, you know, great. So. I appreciate it. OK, well, you're very welcome and um, best of luck and and all life that, you know, everything that comes your way, yeah. <laughs> all that life well, brings, all that. That's yeah, what I'm we'll staying in touch. Greg. Yes, we'll stay in touch. You know, why not? We just, yes. you know, we'll stay in touch. Exactly. If I'm ever out in Texas, I'll let you know. Yes, please do. Although Texas is a big place. So, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize this. I know it's big. It's larger than the UK. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I tell, there's a, a little joke about this, but I'll just, I'll try and tell it quick. I know we, we've been on this for ages, but there was a, a Texan, mm -hmm. a Texan farmer, rancher, went over to uh, Ireland to have a look around with his ancestors and stuff, you know, who's going back to Ireland. And he, he's driving along and he sees this, uh, this old Irish guy sitting there with his pipe sitting on a little <laughs> wall you know uh, in the fields whatever out in the countryside sitting on a stone wall smoking his pipe so uh, the texan the farm the rancher stops and said how are you doing there you know and he said oh you know in irish pleased to meet you like you know whatever and uh, so he the irishman says to him oh where are you from and he said well i'm from uh, texas you know i come from texas i got a ranch <laughs> and, uh, out in Texas, and he he says to the to the little Irish guy, "Oh, well, what do you what do you do?" And he said, "Oh, I'm a farmer. I'm a farmer, sure." And he said, "Oh, how big's your farm?" And he said, "So he just points to this uh, little field that he said, oh, this is my farm. This is it. You know, just one like two acres at the most. You know, so oh, this is my field." And uh, the Texan says to him, well, you know, in my ranch, uh, in my car, it takes me four days to get round my ranch. And the Irishman said, uh, oh, Jesus, you know, I used to have a car like that. <laughs> so, so, uh, I, had, I hadn't heard that one. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> a car that's really slow. That <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, thanks for sharing that. Okay, All right. no worries. I, I really appreciate it, Greg. Thank you. Oh, sure, Kevin. And I will get this um, edited possibly in a week or so. Yeah, um, no worries. All right. No worries. Next week, not this week coming, on the 21st, I'm off to Austria for 12, oh, okay. days, 12 days. So if, I, if it comes before then, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But I, okay. I probably won't look at it till I get back, you know. Okay. I get okay. back on the third of October. So no panic anyway, whatever. Okay. All righty. It works great. All righty. Well, thank you again, Kevin. Okay. No worries. Appreciate it. Thank All you. Right.